Welcome to another episode of Outliers. I'm your host, Daniel Scrivener, and today we have a special, well-off-the-beaten-path show for you. On Outliers, I decode what the top 1% of performers have mastered and what they've learned along the way. In each episode, I dive deep to uncover the tools, habits, and ideas that we can all apply in our own lives. Today, I'm talking with Howard Berger. For nearly 40 years, Howard has worked in special effects for films and TV shows in Hollywood. And in that time, he's won both an Emmy and an Oscar. He's worked with many of the best directors, people like Quentin Tarantino, Paul Thomas Anderson, Sam Raimi, and Martin Scorsese. And he's worked directly with some of the best actors in the world, including Jamie Foxx, Anthony Hopkins, James McAvoy, and Mark Wahlberg. In this episode, we go deep on what the best directors get right, what makes a script great, never repeating yourself, and why laughter is essential for hard work. Howard is the co-founder of KNB EFX Group, which has won multiple Academy Awards, Emmys, and British Academy of Film and Television Awards for their work on everything from the Chronicles of Narnia to The Walking Dead. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Emmy and Academy Award winner, Howard Berger. Howard, I am so excited to have you on the show. I'm a huge fan of, you know, Hollywood movies and television shows and a lot of what you've worked on. So welcome to Outliers. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. It's going to be fun. I'm looking forward to it. I've been looking forward to it for the past couple of weeks. <laughs> so <laughs> it'll be good. Okay. So to kick things off, and I guess, you know, one thing I want to make sure I try to do a good job up front is just teeing up exactly what you do, because it can be, mm-hmm. you know, maybe a little, a little difficult to grasp. When you're at a cocktail party, when you run into someone for the first time, when you mm-hmm. meet someone's mom, like, how do you set up what you do? <laughs> <laughs> if I meet someone, that's, am I meeting the mom at yes, the cocktail yes. party? It's the it's weirdest the cocktail party things. in the world. I was going to say, usually I'll go over and say, hey, I, have had, I haven't seen you here before. I like that in a girl. So that's always <laughs> that's a, a good start. Yeah, thank you. It's, it, it works for me and Bruce Campbell. <laughs> so it seems to work out great. Usually what, you know, when people will say, because they have. So what is it that you do? I know you're in the film industry. And I'll say, well, simple enough, I make monsters for movies. <laughs> And they go, oh, really? Monsters for movies. And granted, it's a lot more than that. It's so much more than that. But that really, people understand that. Like, oh, a creature guy makes creatures and so forth and all that. Because, you know, if I really went in and explained it all to a mom at a cocktail (laughs) party, it might be a little difficult. (laughs) My job's kind of altered and diversified through the years. And what we have in the film industry is people that are called department heads. And department heads are the people that are in charge of, like, the makeup department, the hair department, the you know, lighting, you know, all different sorts. And you're in charge of that department. You're the the master and commander, so to speak. So I'm a department head. So when I work on a film or a TV show, I will oversee everything. So that means all the straight makeup, all the beauty makeup, all the men's grooming, and any of the creature or special makeup effects. And granted, I always look for films that have my passion, which is, you know, special makeup and so forth. But I've also done movies like Instant Family, which was with Mark Wahlberg, where there is no special makeup. And it was just, you know, department head at that and handled Mark's makeup and, and other cast members. And Mark Wahlberg's an outstanding person and great to work with all the time. And so, but yeah, it's a lot of different things. So with that said, as far as being a department head, I'm also part of the production team. So I always make it point when I start a show that I go in and I say, I'm not a vendor. I'm not just a makeup artist. I'm here to assist you with anything else. And a lot of the time, I'll end up working very closely with the AD department. That's the assistant director's department. I work very close with all the actors. My arms stretch very long in a production, and, and I do far more than maybe what a uh, the normal makeup artist might do on a show. It's sometimes people will just focus on their world. Because I'm a film fanatic, I'm a complete cinephile, that I love everything about movies, and I want to know everything about movies, you know, and how they're made and behind-the-scenes stories. And I've been paying attention for 38 years. That's as long as I've been doing this. And I really make it part of my life to, you know, assist every department. There is a movie I did called The Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. And I decided on that movie, I wanted to do spend one day doing everybody's job. And I did. I did one day, including catering, and I made breakfast for 1,200 people at 3 a.m. in the morning. And I did everybody's job. I might have not done it well, but I did it. And I knew I could. And it was really, really super fun. So 
you know, to me, that's also, you know, a sign of somebody who hopefully, you know, would become a good producer, knock on wood, and having an understanding of every single department and what their needs are and how to facilitate all that. So I'm referred to on set a lot of times as the producer who's not a producer. And people will come to me and ask me every question. Actors will come to me and ask, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And I'll say, well, I'm not really a producer, but I'll act as a producer right now. So that's what I do. It's There's a lot to it. But I take that upon myself. It's not like a makeup department head in the Webster's and it says all this stuff. That's me developing the way I am. And Greg Nicotero, who's my business partner and best friend for decades, a business partner at K&B FX Group, same thing. You know, he's always been that way, assumed more responsibility than required. And he's moved up to, you know, being a, a big director and an executive producer and a writer and a showrunner. So it's really, really great. But we have those natural skills and not everybody has that kind of alpha leadership quality about them. You know, Well, it sounds like I clearly you absolutely love what you do. And you've been lucky enough to be able to do that for the Mm -hmm. last 38 years. Just to rewind a little bit, you know, I know growing up, you had a big love for monster films. You know, if you were to try to describe that, like, what was it early on? Was it a film in in particular? Was it a show in particular? Mm -hmm. What hooked you? And what was that moment that you just said, wow, this is this is what I want to do? Yeah, no, absolutely. Listen, I love monsters and movies. My dad was in the industry. He was a post-production sound editor and he loved movies. And we used to watch movies all the time and somehow gravitated to horror films, monster movies. And I was introduced really young, like maybe four years old to like the Godzilla films and so forth and so on. And then I developed a love for the classic monsters because then there were Aurora monster models, which were those really cool build-up models that, that you'd buy. And I think I, I literally discovered those in nursery school. I remember a friend of mine his name was Michael Glass. And I went to his house and he had all of them. And I'm like, what are those? And then I went home for dinner. My folks picked me up and I begged my dad if we can go to Sears and see if they had them there. And they did. They had stacks. And my dad bought me for, I think it was like a dollar forty nine, the King Kong. It was like the greatest thing ever. And I just, my parents or grandparents would always encourage me in the world of monsters. And I think for about three years, I was convinced I was like either Dracula or Godzilla. And, you know, I'd always wear a vampire cape and stomp around the house and destroy my sister's things because that's what Godzilla would do. But when I saw Planet of the Apes, the original Planet of the Apes, that's really where it clicked. And I thought, that's amazing. And there must be somebody in the film industry that makes that like somebody must turn those actors into that. And I asked questions with my dad and found this magazine called Famous Monsters of Filmland. And they had photos and that was it. And I just started to I would draw and draw and draw like all my schoolwork was covered in monster doodles all the time. None of the work was done. <laughs> But there was a ton of monster doodles. So that's really what sparked it. And and the fact that I had parents who were really supportive, they probably thought their kid is crazy and maybe this will blow over. Some kids, you know, like trucks, some kids like sports. I love monsters and I love movies. I I couldn't, I didn't know how to use a hammer, but I could, you know, I could make a pair of vampire teeth, I guess. (laughs) You've worked on an incredible array of projects and, you know, some of Mm -hmm. which from everything from Lone Survivor all the way to the Chronicles of Narnia. So from, you know, kind Mm -hmm. of gritty, real, and like truly horrific all the way to more playful and and fantasy-like. Do you have something you enjoy in particular there or do you just enjoy the variety? Oh, I love the variety, but I really, through the years, have focused on character makeups and fantasy. I'm not a gore guy. You know, I've done so many gore effects. After doing the Kill Bill movies, I pretty much like handed in my my bloody apron and I said, I'm I'm good never doing another blood gag because we had thousands and thousands of blood gags for Quentin. But I also just don't like the fake blood all over me. It's sticky and gross and I hate cleaning it up. And it's not my favorite thing. Greg Nicotero loves blood gags. He's the king of it. So he can have that. I'll do my character makeups and, you know, it's good. But yeah, I love that. I like developing a character with an actor. And I always say, like, I'll bring X amount to the table, X amount of percentage of the character to the table. And then the actor brings the rest and he brings it to life. So I can do a great makeup on an actor that's maybe not so great and it's not really 100 percent. But then I get the opportunity to do a really nice makeup on a really great actor. And they use what I brought as a mm-hmm. tool and it helps them find the character as well. And it just keeps developing and developing and developing. And we work as a team, which is very, very important. Yeah, I want to dive into that because I feel like, you know, so my background's partially in design. I've spent 
been a huge part of my life doing something that, at least from the outside looking in, feels a little bit similar, where, you know, I have oftentimes a loose direction of where I want to head, but then it's this open-ended journey of like, well, actually, I don't end up there. I end up totally somewhere different just based off serendipity and kind of the interplay of factors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the best way I've come to describe it is almost like alchemy. What is that process for you? So you join a new film. Mm -hmm. What's that process of getting a shared vision with the director and the producer and that, that production team? And then what's that process with an actor and actress? Absolutely. That's a good question. So I'll read the script and I'll have my, you know, ideas right away. And then I want to meet with the director and hear what he thinks or she thinks or they think and see what their ideas are. And sometimes they have great ideas. Sometimes they have no ideas and they're looking to us to bring things to the table. Then I'll we'll brainstorm. This is half the time we're brought in way before there's even an actor's cast. So we're already developing characters. We're already trying to figure things out, blah, blah, blah. And then once the actors cast, we'll revisit the artwork. So we usually do a lot of Photoshop art. You know, a lot of we have a whole design team at K and B. And then once the actors cast, we'll take that art that everybody seemed to like and see how it works on the actor's face. And then there's a whole process where we bring the actor in for life casting and they're sculpting and mold making and fa fabricating pieces and so forth. But I would love to know what the actor's thinking. And even when it's a straight makeup, just a beauty makeup, I want to know what the actor's thinking. They know their face better than I do, especially women especially actresses do. And I'm always like, what do you like? Tell me what you like, because, you know, you're going to know better. And then I adjust. And, you know, obviously there's specifics that the film has. But I really love that whole developing with the character. There's many times we'll develop a character and we'll shoot it. And then we'll revisit and I'll go like, ah, it's just not there. I just did this thing on this Amazon show that's going to be out hopefully this year called them and we had a character we developed and did tons of artwork and sculptures and we felt we landed on it had an actor shot it a couple days and then the showrunner his name's little marvin which everybody will be that will be a, a household name soon enough he's a great great guy brilliant brilliant young filmmaker and he came he's like you know i'm rethinking this and i'm like okay he's like i think maybe we want to go another route overall and i'm like okay, I'm good with that. I want to make this better. So we cast an actor who I thought would work really, really well, a guy named Dirk Rogers. And we redesigned the makeup. And instead of what we did the first time, which was a very big prosthetic makeup, it ended up being a little more simple. Like I kind of took it back to the makeup roots where it was a combination of little appliances. That's the things we glue onto people. And then what I call out of the kit. And so that's makeups that, you know, I'm, I'm not having to prep, but I do on their face, like make his face look wrinkly with this material called stretch and stipple and a lot of paint and a lot of highlight and shadow. And it worked out much, much better. And we were able to redefine the character opposed to like sticking with something that we weren't 100 percent there. Like little Marvin and I were like, I'm not sure it's cool, but I don't know. It might be a little too out there for the tone of this show, and that might pull people out. So it was awesome that I had a, a showrunner who was willing to reinvent the wheel, which was great. And I think that's because he's fairly new at this, and he didn't know he's not allowed to do that. So I was so excited, and I didn't say, well, we can't do that. I'm like, sure, we can do that. It was great because we ended up coming up with something, I think, between he and I and Dirk, who played the part, who brought it to life something really, really unique. And when the show comes on, you'll all see it and be like, oh my God, that's pretty awesome. I feel like that's such, it's one of the most difficult parts of the creative process is it is kind of individually and together, you have a sense for what you're trying to go after, but then it's this never ending process of iterating to get there. Just thinking about a project like the Chronicles in Arnia, like mm -hmm. clearly what you're trying to do, I think to create a great film that can stand the test of time, that can stand on its own, is create something that is both universal, where mm -hmm. you're gonna have a lot of appeal from a lot of people, but is also very, very, very particular. You know, it has a very particular point of view. And that is one of the hardest things in the creative process. Mm -hmm. How do you go about navigating that and trying to land on something that is new and innovative, but at the same time, you think it's got broad appeal to it? Well, using Narnia as a point of reference. So Andrew Adamson was the director of the first two of that and Prince Caspian. And he really had a great vision. Like he really, he's been thinking about this all his entire life. And granted, the source material is right there. It's great. I mean, you know, C.S. Lewis wrote these amazing books that are, you know, been cherished by generations after generations after generations. So Andrew really developed what was he was thinking. And what was nice is it was a rare example of a singular voice. There's not a lot of directors, sadly, who have a singular voice. Quentin Tarantino has a singular voice, yeah. like, and you know it, like it's, 
he's he, the buck stops there. So it was that way with Andrew as well. And Andrew had had Shrek under his belt, you know, which is animated, but was made a ton of money and great story. So he had some cachet, you know, he had good pedigree to start with. But we knew we had to create something that wasn't I don't want to say familiar, but that you didn't compare like, oh, that kind of looks like the guy from da, 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 da. So I asked Andrew, I said, what's inspiring you in this? What is your memories of the books? And he said, I'm making this movie is based on my memories as a sick child reading these books over and over again in my bedroom. And that's what I want it to be from the eyes of me as a kid. And I went, I understand. And that really was a key to this. I'm like, there's no preconceived notions. Andrew is remembering how he felt when he was 10 years old, sick as a dog in bed for months, reading all these uh, C.S. Lewis books. One of the other things was that Richard Taylor from uh, Weta Digital, you know, Peter Jackson's company from Weta Workshop, actually, it's Weta Workshop. He was originally going to do the movie. And so they had designed a lot of the characters, spent like a good year designing stuff. But King Kong got greenlit, Peter Jackson's King Kong. And so Richard called me because we'd been best of friends. And he said, listen, I can't do this, but would you consider meeting with Andrew Adamson and maybe this would work out? So I met with Andrew and so did a bunch of other makeup effects people. You know, it wasn't just like, hey, Howard's going to do it. It was like four other people bidding against it. And I had meeting after meeting and the meetings went on for six months until I finally got the phone call. And Andrew said, we want you to be part of the family. And I was so overjoyed. It was like, I'd never felt any better about, you know, landing a show. So we began designing immediately. We had months and months, which was also a rarity because nowadays you get like hours to design a show and prep it. But back then we had something like six months. So at the studio at K&B, they had about 120 people working on the show and we spent night and day on it. And every week, every Friday, we would do an art presentation. So Andrew and the producer, Mark Johnson, and some of the other executives and so forth and other craftspeople showed up. And we would have a big presentation of where we were at, what we were thinking, what our prototypes, because we prototyped everything first. You know, we did like five different Mr. Tumnus makeups that were totally off. And we did some centaurs that were like a little too scary. Fridays were the show and tell. So on Thursday morning, I brought my three children in, which were all young, like from like six to 12. And I would give them the art presentation and they would critique it. And I wanted to know what they thought because they loved the books. They had no preconceived notions, but in their mind, they know what color Mr. Tumnus's hair is. They know the skin color of the white witch. They know if those ears are too big for Mr. Tumnus. Those are all notes, by the way, that they gave me. My daughter, Kelsey, gave me. It's like, the ears are wrong. And the witch doesn't have lips like that. And then and I'm like, okay. And I'd write all these. Yeah, amazing. So I would do that every Thursday. I'd I'd have them come and visit. And they gave me notes and they were really, really helpful because it was through the eyes of a child. It wasn't like, it should be more like Alien and Jaws, but different. You know, it wasn't that at all. Working on the movie was parallel to the, to the book. We basically went through the wardrobe. We lived in Narnia for seven months in New Zealand. And when the movie ended, we came out of the wardrobe and we were all heartbroken. And it literally was... To me, it's my most favorite film I ever worked on, uh, on all levels. And I'm super proud of the work. I'm super proud of the work K&B did. I love the adventure. It was so hard and so difficult and so exhausting. I'm still tired. And that was in 2004. And I still have not caught up on my sleep from working on Narnia. But I was so sad. When I came home from New Zealand, I was sick for two weeks and didn't leave the bed because I was so blue. I was so heartbroken. And I just wish I could go back to Narnia. And then a couple of years later, like a year later, I got a call from Andrew's like, we're doing the next Narnia. And I got to go back to Narnia again. And it was so wonderful, you know, and then I got to do it again. So my wishes came true and my dreams came true. And it was great. And it's a great collaboration. I had a great team and there's a a wonderful makeup artist. Her name's Tammy Lane. And she won the Academy Award with me on for Narnia. And she's amazing. And we've tried to do all the shows together because we don't have to talk. We just have a dance. But that's the sort of things, you know, you build relationships with people. And those are the people that that community is what makes the show successful artistically, creatively, and also just as far as the mental health goes too. you know, you're like, I feel good about all these people. You know, it's a camaraderie that's super important. I love to have fun. That's my number one priority. Whenever I start a show, I get my whole crew together and I go, this is going to be a hard show. 
It's going to be long hours, but we're going to have fun. And that's the priority. The work we can all do in our sleep. That's what we're good at. But we're going to have fun. And if anybody doesn't let us have fun, we clip them. They're out. So we just move forward, have a blast, make this fun and, and enjoy it. Because, you know, what filmmaking is supposed to be fun. It is a challenge. It, it can be difficult. There are certainly limitations that production sets forth sometimes that are very difficult to contend with. At the end of the day, it's the director's vision. And you really all work as a team, I would say under one umbrella, to facilitate that director's vision and, and give him what he wants. Yeah, and try to add as much to it that you can and build on top of it, you know, mm -hmm. flesh it out and take it further than they could take it. I love that note about, you know, just making sure that you're having fun, you're bringing mm -hmm. that joy to it. So clearly part of that's a survival tactic, mm -hmm. but I'm guessing part of that too is maybe this belief that that's going to show up in the film, that that's going to show up in the work. Uh, yeah, I hope so. I mean, unfortunately, some of the most fun I've had on set is more fun making the movie than watching it, sadly. I'll see the movie and I'm like, wow, wait, you know what? We had fun, right? We had fun. I mean, it's not really fun watching this, but we had a good time on set. <laughs> I like to keep, I consider myself a bit of a cheerleader. I want to keep my team's energy up. I don't ever want them to worry anything except about the work. So I take the brunt of everything, but that's what a leader does. It's not, I don't pass the buck. I always say everything after bud is baloney, essentially. My kids know that. Uh, yeah, I'm like, okay, Travis, after butt, it's all baloney. I don't want to hear any more. It's about fun. And I, I like that fun. I mean, I'm a kid at heart. You know, I feel bad for my wife because she's married to, you know, a 56 year old going on you know, 13. You know, it's like not too long ago, I'd like we're, I'm in my home office and I brought home a bunch of like masks and stuff. And I'm like, and she saw me sneak stuff into the house and she came in. She's like, what's all this? I'm like, oh, I'm going to hang it all around the room. Like it's like my bedroom when I was a kid. And she's like, yeah, no, I don't think we're going to do that. And I'm like, no, 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 it's, it'll be cool. She's like, Howard. I'm like, okay, never mind. And I took it all back to the shop. I'm like, damn. And I thought it was, she made, she was right. We don't need a, I don't need a, well, maybe I need one or two masks hanging up, but I love to play. I'm always laughing. It's almost like working in the industry is like dog years, like, you know, one year equals seven years. I always feel like one year in the film industry equals five years to your life. But then I feel you can counteract that with laughter. And the more you laugh, the longer you live. So at this point, I'm thinking I'm going to be probably about a thousand years old because <laughs> I'm always laughing and, and I find humor in everything. So I think that helps. And I think my crew appreciates that because I'm, I can be very serious. And I was lucky to work with Anthony Hopkins on a movie called Hitchcock. And Tony is similar to that. And we were talking about fun and he loves to have fun. He's very mischievous. And he said, you know, the thing is, I don't want anybody to mistake my kindness for weakness. And I said, I like that because I saw Tony like production was trying to take advantage and he would not have it. He stood his ground. And he's like, this is where the kindness, you know, was getting misconstrued as weakness and I'm not weak. And I'm like, go get him, Tony, get him, get him. So, you know, that's a really good term that I, I learned from him and on top of a million other things. But it's true. You know, you can, it's easy to be kind. One thing that um, you've alluded to a few times, you know, I have not been on a Hollywood film set, but mm -hmm. I've been involved in, you know, post-production work and worked with some of the, you know, just absolutely incredible people. But one thing I've taken away from that experience is I've never seen any group of people that work harder than people in the film business, mm -hmm. whether they're editors, whether they're producers, whether they're in post-production, you know, whether they're on set. Talk a little bit about that. Like, how do you survive that? How has that pace changed over time? Yeah, and then how does that show up in the day to day? You know? Yeah, it's hard, man. And, that, and you're right. People on film work their butts off, you know? Insane. It's insane. It is insane. And I have done shows where I've worked hour, like, you know, 90 to 100 hours a week, which is obscene and had very little turnaround, which means the time you go to sleep and the time you wake up. And we have unions, you know, we're all part of unions. I'm a member of uh, Local 706, which is the makeup and hair stylist and makeup artist. And it's a great union. And, you know, they take care of us and they look out for us. And there's rules. Production has to follow. And, you know, a production will always want to, you know, try to bend the rules. But if you're a strong department head, you don't let them. But you love what you do and you care so much about it. You don't want to disappoint anybody. You want to disappoint yourself. Sometimes a film crew won't really click. 
and there's not the camaraderie. But when you hit, when you're on a show and there is like, you're getting along with all the costume people and you're getting along with the camera and you're getting along with script supervisor and so forth, then it's really magical because you feel like you're a team and you're friends with everybody. And I, again, surround myself with very optimistic and positive people. So I don't have people like, yeah, these guys, you know, suck and this is terrible and I hate them. And, you know, I don't have room for that. I don't have time for that. And I don't want that sort of energy invading my department or the film set. You need to keep a positive attitude and like, this is going to be great. And even if you're having a bad day, you know, tomorrow's a new day and it's going to be a better day. And even if it's not a better day, you got another day that's going to be better. It's going to be better. Eventually, Quentin Tarantino always says, you know, when we're on set, if something goes great, he'll say, you know, you're a hero today, but tomorrow you could be a bum. So just be glad you're a hero. But just remember, you could be a bum tomorrow. And I'm like, okay. We've K and B has done movies with him since the very beginning. Since and we've done every single one of his films, and and Greg Nicotero has been so lucky enough to do most of them. I haven't. I was on which he didn't direct, but I was there every day at, with Greg, and also I I ran. But Greg has handled everything else for Quentin. So I mean, he's one of the best directors, if not the best, in my opinion. Just on every level, you know, you know, you go home beat up like you're a beaten dog when you go home. Boy, that was a good beating. I feel great, man. That was we should, we made some movie magic today, you know, only the way Quentin could do it because he's so unique. Quentin's movies are filled with camaraderie. Like Quentin makes sure, like, you know, when we were in China, it's like we're all going to a party, you know, and we all got in a van and all went or a bus and went to the Great Wall with Quentin and had a big party all you know all night long. <laughs> so you've touched on, you know, a few things that you find just really magical about working with different directors. What are you really looking for? And what do the best directors that you've worked for, what do they do that other directors don't? Or what do they do that is able to elevate the team? I'm just curious, what have you learned and taken away from the best directors Mm, you've worked with? Yeah, well, the best directors are the ones that come prepared. They understand the script. Sometimes they don't. Some of them, I even wonder (laughs) if they ever read the script. But they have a plan. (laughs) They're sensible. They listen. They respect your opinion and your contribution. And then they let me, they plant a seed and let that seed grow instead of, you know, and I watch that with actors. And that's how I judge a good director is the way the director deals with actors. And I've seen directors give no, not even know what type of director. Like, okay, that was great. Uh, Just do it again. Oh, is there anything different? No, no, no. Just do it the same way. And, you know, and it's like, that makes no sense. (laughs) Quentin, I observed, treats every actor differently. And he kind of tailors his directing style per actor. And that really impressed me. And I really enjoyed watching him. I mean, if there was an actor who was like needed to be a little roughed up a little bit, who was, you know, needed a little gruff direction, he was willing to do that, you know, and kind of like, come on, what are you, you know, let's go. What are you doing? You know, know your lines. But then if there was somebody who needed to be a little more, you know, handled with kit gloves, he would be like, okay, you know, that's cool. No, it actually, let's stop. Let's you and I go take a walk. And I saw him do this. Let's take a walk and let's, just take a little walk and everybody will wait. And when you're ready, we'll come back and do it. And I'm like, this guy is amazing. A director who does his homework, I really do expect a director to show up and know what he's doing each day, you know, have a plan, a shot list, essentially, of like, these are the shots I want to do. Sam Raimi is that way. He's a great director, over unbelievably prepared, shows up with a shot list. You get a shot list every day. Storyboards attached to the shot list. I know exactly what we're doing. I know what he wants to see. It's, it makes it so much easier. And to me, it's disrespectful when a director shows up and hasn't done their homework. Who knows what they did when they went home, but they don't. They show up not knowing what they're shooting first, have no clue how the scene's going to go together, has no idea this, that, and another thing. And I've experienced, unfortunately, lately a few of those. And it's really disrespectful to the crew. I get really upset. And it's like, you know what? If I performed the way that guy performed, I'd be fired. You know, you expect us to bring our, our A game And you're bringing like your G game, you know, I'm like, dude, (laughs) what are you doing? What do you do when you go home? You know, but the guys that really love filmmaking and understand the process and ask questions. That's the other thing, too. Asking questions is super important. No question is dumb. No question is stupid. Ask the question. And you'll get an answer. And, and I'm good for with educating producers and directors and PAs and, you know, anybody costume. I, I'll, you know, I'm, I think education is unbelievably important and we need more of that. And, and people need to not feel so insecure about asking questions. Those are the attributes I look for in a director, you know. So you mentioned this earlier of just, you know, how you start out your process reading the script, mm-hmm. you know, reading the screenplay. 
is something I kind of stumbled into a few years ago is I'm starting to read screenplays instead of books. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, to be super honest, I find screenplays way more enthralling than just fiction <laughs> or nonfiction books yeah. because I can picture it in my head. It gives you a sense for context. It feels like this rich, vivid medium. And Quentin Tarantino scripts are absolutely incredible. They are just they are. So, they're so dialed in and they have such an interesting character to them. What are you looking for when you get a script? And what do you need to see for you to know that this is a project, one, that you'd enjoy, but this is a project that you could take on and, and take somewhere and that you're super excited to, you know, chip into. Well, anything from Quentin. I mean, even if Quentin wrote a movie called My Little Pony, I'm like, this is going to be the best My Little Pony movie ever. So, you know, it's anything that comes out of his fingertips is genius. But I'd say the three screenwriters and filmmakers that I, whose scripts I love the most, and I've had the most fun reading is Quentin, Frank Darabont, and M. Night Shyamalan. And it's because they were so, let's see, they weren't meaty scripts. And actually, Paul Thomas Anderson, too. Paul's scripts are fantastic. They are just enough words to tell the story. And you picture it. Like when we, were, we worked on Unbreakable with M. Night, and I read the script, and then I saw the movie, and I was like, unbelievable. It's exactly the way I remembered it. Pulp Fiction, when I read that script, and especially when the scene where, you know, John Travolta goes to Bruce Willis's apartment, the way Quentin described it in the script, and when I was on set, I looked around and I went, this is a thousand percent out of the script. It's so Quentin's words are so vivid, and he uses just enough words to tell that story. It's not a big meaty thing. And that's probably like, I've been getting back into reading books lately just because I feel stupid. And uh, I'm like, I got to do something other than watch Netflix for goodness sakes. But yeah, at times I find myself because I read hundreds of scripts every year. I find myself drifting. I also suffer from dyslexia. So I have to go back and reread and reread. But in those scripts, I don't, I get it all. I, I absorb it. Reading Green Mile. I remember I got that script and I sat down and I read it and I cried at the end. And like, I never, ever got emotional reading a script, but it was so beautiful in the way Frank explained everything and told the story. And I felt it in my heart. I felt the sadness and loneliness of losing everybody you knew, you know, the Tom Hanks character, Paul, everybody he knew is gone but he'll continue to live. And it was very heartfelt. And I remember putting it down and my wife said, how was it? And I was just bawling. And I'm like, best script I ever read. But those filmmakers, those four filmmakers, Quentin, PTA, M. Night, and Frank Darabont are just unbelievable writers and magical. And when you read one of those and it's for a project that, you know, so you read the script, you end up getting excited about it and you say, yes, I'm sure the wheels in your head are turning the whole time you're reading the script. Do you start sketching right away? Do you try to, you know, allow everything that you've read to sink in? What is the process, I guess, from taking in an idea? And then how does that then turn into you starting to shape that in your own mind? Well, I like to read it from beginning to end, just like I see a movie, you know, and I want to just absorb the storytelling. Then I'll go back and pinpoint, I'll highlight all the stuff that I think I'd be responsible for. And then I'll start thinking about, I'll break it down and start having discussion with the designers and with Greg. And, and we figure out like, okay, this might look like this. And here's some ideas. And, you know, sometimes we'll put together kind of a little bit of a lookbook and show the director and like, this is kind of what we're thinking, you know, is it kind of in this vein or this vein? It's like, yeah, you know, then there's directors that you've worked with for a long time that you have a shorthand with Frank Darabont, we have a shorthand with and same with Quentin and uh, Robert Rodriguez. And I remember on Green Mile, there was a specific makeup on Patricia Clarkson, who uh, plays the wife that has brain cancer. And, you know, and they had done a couple tests and Frank just wasn't happy with it. And it wasn't because it wasn't good. It just wasn't what he was thinking. And he couldn't express to the makeup artist what he wanted. I was already on the show and I was there doing something else. And he said, Howard, I need you. I need help. I want vampires. John Carpenter's vampires. And I went, all right, I know what you need. So I went home and I got a cast of Patricia and I sculpted these little socket pieces and all. And I did a test makeup and he's like, that's at a hundred percent. And I said, but I speak the same language. You know, I understand your Darabont speak, you know, same with Sam Raimi. I understand Sam. I understand Quentin. You know, we understand Robert Rodriguez, you know, and like this little Marvin I was talking about, you know, speaks the same way. You know, I can, he can say one thing, you know, say like Henrietta. And I'm like, yeah, Henrietta from Evil Dead. Got it. I'm on it. I know exactly what you want. And then, but those are planting the seeds, you know, and that's, what's really, really great about it. And you can then amazing things can grow out of it. Going back a little bit to the beginning of your career, you know, something I've always been 
just found fascinating and, and also wonderful about Hollywood is it does very much seem like it still thrives on apprenticeship, you know, mm-hmm. like so much of getting in the industry is kind of earning your way up. Like what was the first film set that you were on and what was that process for you of kind of getting started in the industry? Well, I was extremely proactive and annoying to my idols like Stan Winston and Rick Baker and Dick Smith. And I really pushed myself on them as, as a little kid you know, writing them and calling them and even showing up at their studio and knocking on the door, you know, holding a box of garbage that I thought was kind of cool. And they were very supportive. But, you know, you say apprenticeship and and there used to be an apprenticeship in the industry that when the studios ran everything and it was really, really great. Like just using my department, makeup and hair as a point of reference, there used to be a makeup and hair apprenticeship. And you had to go through that in order to, you know, be eligible to, you know, join the union and get jobs. And I feel like we really miss that now. Now we take apprenticeship on ourselves, you know, through whatever it kind of dissolved and the studio system dissolved. I think that might've been it, but it'd be really, really wonderful to, to have the apprenticeship program because then instead of people coming out of schools and only knowing the curriculum, they'll have a full spectrum of everything and be forced into doing the worst job to the best job, you know, and that's important instead of like, all right, sculpt a skull. Okay. Sculpt a foot. Okay. Do a zombie makeup. Okay. Do a, you know, a fantasy makeup. Half the time the kids do things that are too big for them. You know, when I was a kid, I made a bunch of monster stuff and I went to visit Stan Winston and Stan Winston did Terminator and did the Terminator films, did Aliens, did Jurassic Park, won multiple Academy Awards. I worked for him for years. Magnificent person. I love him so much. And he went through the apprenticeship program, but he over at Disney with Robert Schiffer. And when I brought stuff in, he's like, yeah, this is all fine, but why don't you do a fake nose? So he's like, you got to crawl before you walk. And you have to walk before you run. And right now you're just running, but you don't know how to run. So go home and sculpt a nose, sculpt an ear. And I did what he said. And it's true. I was able to. He's like, if you can do a great fake nose, that's hard because that's right in the center of your face. So I took all the lessons that Stan gave me, which I thought were essential. And then I got, you know, a lucky chance to meet Rick Baker. And Rick Baker's, you know, has won seven Academy Awards, did the Men in Black films and American World in London and Thriller and Greystoke and Mighty Joe Young. And I mean, Rick is, I idolize Rick to no end. I've known Rick since I was 13 years old. And even now when I see him, me being 56, I get nervous and all butterfly and giggly because I'm like, oh, it's Rick Baker. You know, he's he's godlike to me. He's magical to me. But I learned so much from that and always listened and observed. So nowadays, what we try to do is we're trying to personally and individually have an apprenticeship program within our own industry. We're taking it upon ourselves. And especially in light of uh, trying to be more inclusive and diverse in the people that are in our industry. So I'm curious, you know, part of your work, especially I imagine as a, as a department head is, you know, putting together an incredible team. Mm-hmm. And you talked about a little bit of that a second ago. What are you looking for from the people that you recruit on your team? And, and when do you know that someone's got it? You know, when do you know that uh, this person's amazing? You know, I know if I looked at their resume or looked at their track record, maybe that's not there yet, but I know that they've got something like, what's that like? And I mm-hmm. guess, what are you really looking for there? Well, if we're talking about K&B, for starters, K&B and all makeup effects shops are basically the island of misfit toys. So it's like all the broken, weird, misshapen, reject toys all somehow gravitate to the world of makeup effects. And everybody's their own individual. And it's the funniest thing watching all these guys and gals. So, And I look for people, for me... The art, of course, is very important, but I'm not always looking for artists. I'm looking for craftspeople, too, people that Mm -hmm. are great thinkers, that think outside the box, that can, you know, do this project or I can hand this over. And attitude is a huge thing. We've had people that are great artists, but not really great people. And we've weeded Mm -hmm. them out. And then I've had people that are really maybe not the best artists, but they're really wonderful people. And we've kept them on and we've nurtured them. And they've become very successful in what they do. I'm way more willing to be patient and invest my time into people that want to be there and yeah. really love it. That's important. So that, I look for that. And I look for that in on an onset crew, too. I don't want anybody who doesn't want to be there. And then at the same vein, I'm not going to ask anybody to do something I'm not comfortable doing. So if I had to like, hey, I have to climb up that ladder, which I hate heights, but I'm going to climb up that ladder and make sure it's safe and, you know, go do that touch up. So then if I need somebody else to do it and I make sure this environment's safe, 
there's no reason not to. So, but I, I always look for people that are enthusiastic, that are going to be part of the team, that are going to make us look better. Like when I hire a key, a key is the person who's second in charge. And why I like to work a lot with Tammy Lane, Tammy is way better at certain things than I am, you know, and I'm better at certain things than she is. Not many, but maybe one or two things, but it's, <laughs> it's good. You know, you want to have people that are better than you that do certain things. Like I'm not that proficient at beauty makeup on women. I can do it, but I'm not all that comfortable with it. It's probably the thing I'm least comfortable with because I don't know. I get a little nervous because it's a woman's face. They know their face better than I do. So I'm like, Hey, Tam, you want to do this makeup? You know? And it's so, cause Tammy's way better at it. So I look to people that have you know, strength in that area more so than I do. I'm good with it. I'm good with delegating. And that's something I had to learn through years and years is to delegate things. I didn't want to. I'm like, I got it. I can take care of it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Well, you can't. You go crazy and stuff falls through the cracks. So I've certainly learned to delegate. It's very important. And you find people you trust, people you can give the assignment to, and they run with it. I don't want to be there and nitpick like, hey, you know what? That vein should probably go here. It's instead of like, no, no, that's cool. Just keep going. Maybe do this and this, but know what? It's yours. It's an alien. Run with it. Don't make it blue. That's all I say. Don't make it blue. <laughs> <laughs> Goes back to your idea of, you know, planting a seed and letting it grow. Absolutely. And not trying to control, not trying to take, you know, too much control of that. Right. To let it happen. One thing that clearly stood out to me, and you already mentioned it, was working with Anthony Hopkins mm. on Hitchcock. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's an example of something that I find so magical and only happens in Hollywood movies where, you know, an actor literally transforms and a big part of, you know, and that is at every level, you know, they transform their speech, they transform their mm -hmm. mannerisms, they look completely different. What does that process look like when you're working with an actor? Like, I'm just so curious. Is there a moment where it all clicks together? Oh, yeah. Does it just kind of build over time? What is that like? Well, Tony's an exception to the rule. I mean, you know, he's the greatest actor around. And, you know, when I got hired right away, you know, I started work. And this is all what made that all work is Tony was accessible to me anytime I needed him, which that's a rarity. Usually like, I oh, will send a double. And I'm like, that's not a true test. Testing this makeup on a double is not testing it on Tony. Sure. So Tony was always really good. And so the first time we did the test makeup, we did six versions of that makeup and it looked great. It looked just like Alfred Hitchcock and Tony loved it. It was much bigger, but it was, he was like, Howard, I don't even need to act in this. And I'm like, no, I need you to act in this, Tony. <laughs> that's what's going to bring it to life. I said, it's just a tool. Anyhow, it looked just like Alfred Hitchcock, but I lost Tony in the makeup. And I'm like, hmm. we need to reinvent this. This is, it's a great Alfred Hitchcock makeup, but it's not a, it's more of a likeness makeup. And I want to do a portrait. My wife actually coined that phrase. She's like, you're not doing a likeness, you're doing a portrait. And I'm like, she's right. Hmm. It's a portrait. It's my impression of Alfred Hitchcock on Tony Hopkins. So I wanted to do something that was a combination. So we kept redesigning. I had a great sculptor, um, Richie Alonzo, who's an amazing artist, sculpted all the makeups for me over and over and over again until we finally hit one, kept testing it on Tony. He'd show up at my shop at 6 a.m., go in my office where I have a big makeup station and do the makeups and test it out and get him fully dressed. And it helped him find his character. I remember there was one time where Tony has really big blue eyes and Alfred Hitchcock had brown eyes. And I was like, Tony, I really feel like we need to do specialty contact lenses. And he, and he was like, ah, Howard, I think we're good. I don't want to, I don't want to do the lenses. And I'm like, let me make a set of lenses and let's just, can we just try them? He's like, Howard, I don't think people are going to realize it. It's going to be fine. I'm like, okay, well, let me make a pair of lenses and let's just take a look. So we made a pair of lenses and we did a test and I put the lenses in and Tony was like, my God, that is, that's it. It clicked. That's what we've been missing. And I'm like, yeah, I know I've been saying that, but you know, until it's your idea, it's not anybody's idea. So, so Tony's like, Howard, you were right. Let's do this. And I'm like, thank you, Tony. It really ties it all. It tied the room together. So, which was great. And then of course, you know, with Tony's magnificent performance and Julie Weiss's costume, she built this undersuit, this kind of like, you know, fat undersuit for Tony to wear. And the costumes were beautiful. But that was a great example of having the time. That was the thing, too. When I got approached, I said to the studio, I have to have time to do this. This is not a two week prep. This is like a three month prep. And I need the mm -hmm. I need the time. If you're not going to give me the time, then I'm going to say thank you very much and move on. Wow. You've worked with just, you know, a, a who's who's list of incredible actors and actresses from Jamie Foxx to mm. Anthony Hopkins to Samuel Jackson. And I could quote names for <laughs> many more minutes. What have you learned that is surprising and interesting, you know, from the actors and actresses that you've worked with? Like what stands out from the most mm. remarkable ones, the ones that are best at their job? Gosh, what have uh, you taken away from what they bring to the role? 
tips? What has that been like? I've been so lucky. And no, a question that gets asked a lot to me is like, you must work with like some really difficult, horrible actors. And no, I don't because they're not. I love actors. I love them. I'd say James McAvoy, who was an unknown when we did Narnia. Mm -hmm. I just, I love him with all my heart. He is a great friend still. And it was really fun to watch him become this movie star on this film. And the next movie he did was uh, King of Scotland you know, which is a great film. And I watched that film and I watched decisions James made that were so subtle. And I was like, God, he's, he's just amazing. He's really, he's just picking up. But I learned a lot from James. Jamie Foxx, who K&B has worked with all, quite a bit, but I had the pleasure of doing Jamie's electro makeup for The Amazing Spider-Man Part 2. And Jamie was such a great guy, such a giving, considerate person and actor. And again, patient. There were, I went to see Jamie before we started and I had all this artwork that Nicotero had supervised and, and really like ushered in with the production, like got to the point, like this is where the studio wants the lecture to be. And Greg did all that. And I stepped in because I was going to go to set. So I went to go see Jamie and I brought all the artwork and I said, before we talk about this, I need you to look at all the art and I'm going to tell you what you're in for. And you have to let me know that you're going to be okay. Because if you're not, this is going to be miserable and it should be fun. And Jamie looked at everything. He's like, dude, I'm so in, I can't tell you. But Jamie couldn't have been better. And I learned humor. I mean, more humor because Jamie's a very funny guy. You know, we had 3 a.m. calls. He'd come in singing and great mood. And we had a thing with all the crews. It'd be myself and Peter Montagna doing Jamie. And then Josh Turry and Tammy Lane doing Clay, who was Jamie's uh, stunt double. We had always two electros on set. Two electros for the price of one. And we would do a thing where Jamie would start a conversation every morning of something, you know, just controversial or whatever. And then he would say, okay, and when we're done with the makeup, everybody ponder it. Now it's time to ponder and we'll reconvene at cleanup time. And then all of us would come back in and clean up and we'd take, we'd start talking. He's like, so what did you think, Howard, what did you think about this? And I'm like, well, this is my feeling. And Jamie, what was your thought? And da, 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 da. And it, he just made it so wonderful and just because it was it was could be a drag for him i mean there were days where i he was like in a full nude prosthetic makeup except wearing like a little you know bikini thing it was a good five hours to get him in it then he would shoot 12 hours and then it'd take two hours to clean him up wow never said a word never said a word and just was a complete gentleman like one of the best Colin Farrell, I got to do a movie with him and became friends. And he's wonderful, so collaborative, you know, great ideas, super, again, super patient. I put him through some horrible stuff in the, in the remake of Fright Night that Greg Gillespie directed, who also directed I, Tanya, really cool director, but just let us go. And, he, and there's another example. He just planted the seed between Craig and Colin. We came up with some amazing stuff, you know, great production design stuff, great actual sculptures that like Jeremy Aiello did for us at K&B. Yeah, it just goes on and on and on. Like I just, you know, once I have the trust of the actor and I trust the actor, then I, I really feel good about it. And I'm also there, I think as a makeup artist, you're actually kind of a little bit of like a bartender slash psychiatrist. And, you know, you spend more time with actors than anybody. You start their day, you're with them all day long, and then you finish their day when they come and get cleaned up. And, you know, and, and it's been nice. Sometimes we have actors who just love being in the trailer. I did a film called The Gambler, and Jessica Lang did a week on it. And she gravitated to the trailer. Like I, I have my hair department head, a guy named Johnny Villanueva, who I met on Lone Survivor. We do everything together. And he and I are the best team. And we run the best departments because we just like to have fun. And we're very similar. We love to laugh. And Jessica loved the vibe. And she would always come to the trailer and hang out you know, during lunchtime or whatever. She's like, why do I want to be by myself in my trailer? I hang out with you guys. You guys make me laugh all the time. And we have such a good time. And yeah, and it's true. You know, we'd watch stuff on television. We watch Cheaters, you know, she's like, what is this show? I'm like, it's called Cheaters. She's like, it's the greatest <laughs> show I've ever seen. So it's stuff like that or John Goodman. And, you know, you build a um, environment in the makeup trailer that the actors feel they're safe and that they're being taken care of and being respected and are there to have a good time. And that's really, really important to me. Like Johnny and I did a film with Alan Arkin and Mark Wahlberg, a thing called Spencer Confidential. And I love Alan Arkin. I always wanted to meet him. And he didn't really need makeup, but I brought him in every day so Johnny and I could talk to him. And he finally started <laughs> to realize, and he's like, Howard, what? why do I even come in here? I said, because I want to talk to you. He's like, but you do like a minute makeup on me, but you take like 20 minutes to do it. And I went, because I want to talk to you, because I, I think you're so magnificent. He's like, 
well, just tell me you want to talk and we'll just go come to my trailer. And we'll talk. I don't need to come in here. I'm like, fine. So Johnny and I would go to his trailer and hang out and just talk to him. I'm just like, <laughs> Alan Arkin is the greatest guy on earth. You know, I have also learned because I get to work with so many actors that you still have to draw a line in the sand for yourself. I don't go out and have dinner with actors. When I say I'm friends with them, that, you know, occasional like text message or maybe a call like, hey, just checking up to say hey, or, you know, it's not like, hey, man, let's go out and let's be best friends and let's go to Disneyland and hold hands. You know, it's not that. I just keep in touch because I actually truly care about them and really like them, you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you have to be careful of your relationship. You know, you need to keep it. You're still a professional level you have to do. That's number one. And then just to be there and be their confidant and so forth. And they need to feel safe is the big thing. The makeup mm -hmm. trailer should always be their sanctuary. There's a few things that I just have to ask about, has to have to touch on. Yeah. And one of those is going back to the Chronicles of Narnia. You know, on that film with your team, you won an Oscar. I did. What was that experience like? What was it like to learn that you had been nominated? What was it like to wait until that night? What was it like to, to hear that you had won? Like, was it just all one dream sequence? Yeah. Well, I grew up watching the Academy Awards. I've been watching it ever since I can remember. And my dad loved it. And we would watch it every time it was on every year. And, you know, I always dreamed of being in the uh, film industry. And once I understood what the Academy was, it'd be really cool to be in the Academy and someday and, you know, all this stuff. Anyhow, you don't go into a movie thinking this is my Oscar. And there are people that do that. And that's, I believe in karma and that works against you. So the second yeah. you go, you know, this is my Oscar. You're never going to win that Oscar for that. It's you just jinxed yourself. And I, it's, it sounds crazy, but I do believe it. And I feel like, like that's, that's a scientific fact. And uh, uh, <laughs> it's not an alternative fact. It's a scientific You heard it fact. here. Yes, it's true. So when I did Narnia, when we did Narnia, I never thought about that. I was just like, I think I did a great job and I had a best time ever. So when it came, when I heard, hey, your movie's being considered for an Academy Award or, you know, for best makeup, it's one of, it could be a contender. I'm like, wow, that would be amazing. Like that would be a dream come true. But, you know, that's cool. It's just, it's gravy, you know, on top of like, I got to do a cool movie and I made a good living and I had the best time and I'm proud of what I did. So that's the payment, you know, yeah. that's the payoff and people like the movie. So anyhow, the night before the Academy Award nominations are announced, and I made it down to what's called the Bake Off. And the Bake Off is a part of the Academy where there's seven movies that are selected. And then you go talk about the movie to the voting members and have a like a five or a 10 minute clip. And I did that. And I didn't know. So there was voting. And so I waited. And then I was very excited. And I went to bed. And I bought a bottle of champagne just in case. And so I woke up in the morning and, you know, when you turn the TV on, they don't announce and best makeup is, you know, because they want to talk about <laughs> everything else. So I was like, I don't know. I wonder. And then I got a phone call at like 630 in the morning and it was Mark Johnson, who was the producer on the film. And he said, hey, Howard. I went, hey, Mark. Well, congratulations. You've been nominated for an Oscar. And I was like, oh, my God. And I was out of my mind. And I told my kids and I got the bottle out and I popped the bottle. I still have the bottle in the cork. And uh, I drank it all and then somehow went to work and, uh, <laughs> and was so excited. I got nominated for an Academy Award. It's like my dream come true. You know, one of my dream, one of my many dreams. But I never expected it, though. Nor did I think I deserved it, but I think I earned it. I don't believe anybody deserves anything, mm. but people can earn something. And I felt the work I did had earned that recognition. So Tammy Lane and I are nominated. It's an amazing month. My friend Dave Anderson, who won an Oscar for Men in Black and Nutty Professor, along with Rick Baker, called me and he said, and we were nominated together. Like his movie, Cinderella Man, was nominated. I was nominated. Then Star Wars, Return of the or Revenge of the Sith or something was nominated. And Dave said, I have some advice for you because Dave had already been nominated and won. He said, have fun and be drunk the whole time just drink the whole month. And I'm like, okay, I can do that. So anyhow, it was just a great thing. It was one wonderful thing after another. We got to go to the luncheon, which is amazing. We got to go to all these parties that the studio sent. The studio sent me on like a publicity tour. They realized like, hey, Howard Berger is kind of a secret weapon because he's not like a standard guy who just like stands there and, well, uh, yeah, we had a good time. It was really fun. We did a lot of stuff. Yeah. Uh huh. Like I'm there to entertain. I'm like, turn it on. Yeah. Here we go, everybody. So Disney started sending me around to like South by Southwest to promote the film and do a bunch of things. It was really fun. Anyhow, Oscar night came and Tammy and I got ready together at my house and my date and her date. And we went to the Oscars and we 
our hearts are pounding out of our chest. And there's a point where they move you. Like our seats were kind of in the back, but the, during the commercial break, they move you forward so that uh, you have a short walk. And one thing they tell you is you have one minute to get up there, say the speech and get off, or they're going to play the music. And you see behind the audience is a giant digital clock ticking off, tick, tick, tick. So they're about to announce it, make up its Will Ferrell and Steve Carell are giving the award. Amazing. They've made themselves up. <laughs> like like haphazardly and I'm, I think it's the funniest thing and here are two of my favorite comedians giving this award and so I'm sitting next to Tammy and then they go and the Oscar goes to Howard Berger, Tammy Lane, Chronicles of Narnia and I grab Tammy and I pull up and say come on we got a minute and we go all the way up and then I see Will and I see Steve Carell we get it and I've already you know have a speech because you only have a minute I so wanted to like wrap it up and let Tammy speak and I didn't do it quick enough and she didn't get a chance. They cut it off. They cut the sound off. And I feel bad about that. But I feel like I needed to say what I needed to say. It could be my only opportunity to ever do this. Mm-hmm. And it was a magical night. And we've got to go to the Vanity Fair party. You know, I remember we we had a limo and we drove there. And the security checks. And they're like, do you guys have a ticket? And we, to the cut of the Vanity Fair. And we both hold out our Oscars. And they go, you got a ticket to go anywhere you want. So we went to the Vanity Fair and then we ended our night at Jerry's Deli at 4.30 in the morning having pastrami sandwiches, had our Oscars on the table and anybody that was in there and came by could hold the Oscar and and take a picture with it. And it was one of the most fun nights I ever had. And the next day, this shows you that even though you win an Oscar, you still have to go back to the real world. And so I had to, I had to go. <laughs> it's only one night. Yeah. So I got up in the morning. I went to K&B, showed off the Oscar, and then I had to go do some chores. And I had to go pick all my kids up from school. But I took the Oscar with me and I went into their room and I'm like, hey, kids, this is the Academy Award. So it was really, really fun. And then I got nominated again for Hitchcock. We didn't win, unfortunately. But what was fun is Tammy was nominated for The Hobbit. I was nominated for Hitchcock. So it was great to go through that process again with her, my best best friend, but neither of us won. So that's okay too. But yeah, it's a great experience. And again, it's gravy, you know, but I feel very, very honored and very grateful. And, you know, people in my branch, my makeup and hair branch are wonderful. They're my peers. I respect all of them. And, you know, this past last year, I became a governor of my branch along with uh, Lois Burwell, who's the vice president of the Academy as well, and Linda Flowers. And yeah, it's a great thing. And I get to be really involved. The, The thing I think I regret the most is my father passed away 25 years ago, and he never got to see any of this. And I think that if he had the opportunity, he'd flip. He would be like, what do you mean you won an Oscar? What do you mean you're going to the Oscars? How are you? What? You're a governor at the Academy? So it's like all this stuff, you know, is so great. And it always goes back to me thinking about my parents, because both my parents were passed a long time ago. And I always think like, yeah, man, if they were here, they'd flip because this is like my, this was my dad's dream, you know? And I just really was lucky that I got to you know, live it, you know, and I just know that he's hopefully looking down and going, wow, this is, I can't even believe that, you know, my son has accomplished so much. So I'm very proud of what I've done, but I, I'm also very, very grateful every day I wake up and I'm like, thank you so much for letting me do this. You know, mm-hmm. it's a dream. I don't take one single moment or one single minute or day for granted because it's very easy for me not to be here. It's just a lot of hard work, a lot of just having taken the initiative. It was scary. I was scared taking a chance all the time. Like when I used to work for people, I used to work for Rick Baker and Stan Winston and Kevin Yeager. And then one day I said, I'm going to start my own company with my friend, Greg Nicotero. That meant I might not ever, that company could have failed. I would have no money. I'd be broke. I'd be out of the business, but I was lucky. And both Greg and I had such drive. There was no way we were going to let that company fail. And it's been 32 years. We've had K and B and K and B is a, you know, is an iconic makeup effects studio in the film industry. And it all started in a teeny tiny little shop, a little room, 800 square foot. We're now 20,000 plus. So it's pretty amazing. What has that collaboration been like? I mean, I think, you know, there's very few instances I can think of, of someone having, you know, a a true partner, a best friend, someone that they love working with, that they've gotten to build something over decades and you've gotten to do this for 32 years. What is, what has that been like? Well, it's been great. I mean, Greg and I were, became fast friends. I worked on a movie called Day of the Dead, a George Romero zombie movie. Then we worked for Tom Savini and that was my first location. I was 18 years old and Greg was 19 and Greg and I, we just met and we we're like, I think we're going to be best friends for life. So I talked Greg into moving to LA, which he finally did. And we got a house and we had a bunch of roommates and 
we all worked on different shows and some shows together. And at a certain point, I said, you know, we should start our own company because we're not making the money. We're not getting the recognition. You know, nobody knows who we are, but we're running the shows. Mm-hmm. And he's like, yeah, let's do it. So we've got a little show we did for like 700 bucks, but it turned out it led to one thing after another, after another, after another. And I think of Greg, Greg's my brother. He's the brother. I have three sisters that are all younger. I don't have a brother, but Greg's my brother and I cherish him and I love him in that way. And I respect him immensely. And I always did. And granted, like any brothers, brothers fight, brothers argue, brothers sometimes disagree. But the underlying relationship is you love that person to no end. And I would do anything for Greg. And I think Greg would do anything for me. You know, I think we're going to be friends till we die. And nothing's going to ever change that. You know, it doesn't mean that we'll have K and B forever. Who knows what happens? You know, they might just go, yeah, we're done with the film industry. We have this new thing. Apple came out with a chip and you just put it in your neck and you watch whatever you want. So I'm like, okay, there you go. But I do know that we'll be friends forever. And we're going to be in that old age home together the motion picture old age home together. Our iron lungs will be right next to each other and it'll be great. That sounds beautiful. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. So you've done so much. We've covered so many films here. And, you know, for anyone that's interested, I highly encourage people to go on IMDb and and browse through everything (laughs) that you've worked on over time. Are there things that you're still itching to work on? Mm -hmm. Is there like a type of movie you love? And and what does that look like? Well, there's two directors I would love to work with. And I don't think I'm going to get the chance to. I would love to work with Woody Allen, but Woody Allen doesn't ever need my services. So I respect, I think he's a magnificent filmmaker. And I would love to work with Clint Eastwood. And he ha- he runs a tight ship. The guys he's been working with forever are still there. So he's very he's a loyalist. So I don't see why he'd go like, I think I'm going to switch over and use Howard to do this show. But those are the two filmmakers I'd love to work with. I'm really trying to break into producing. There's a project I'm interested in that I, I'm trying to develop that I hope will lead into that. I love what I do, but I feel like I need to start segueing into something else and use my other talents to make better sense of filmmaking, which I know I can. Hmm. I've currently been co-writing a book. I've been researching. I'm doing a book with a a good friend of mine, a writer, Marshall Julius in in the UK. And it's going to be cool. I think it'll be out next year. We've been interviewing tons of makeup effects people and actors and directors and visual effects people and editors. And it's basically a book about relationships and camaraderie and adventure and fun stories. It's not a technical manual about like, and then I put the glue down and it's none of that nonsense. It literally is some amazing stories and people have amazing stories about their experiences with specific actors. It's not a rag mag. It's not a dirt book. They're all, it's all about fun. And I think people will really, really enjoy it. So we're hoping that that will, we got to finish writing it. It's taking a long time, but we started, the pandemic actually helped us. Like Marshall called and he's like, now we should write that book we've been talking about for 12 years. And I'm like, <laughs> perfect yeah. opportunity. And I'm like, okay. And we did, we, we I've, we've interviewed over 50 people so far for this book and it's really going to be a great book. So keep your eye out for it. It's, it's going to be called practical magic. So yeah, we're, we're trying to get that going, but that's not going to be till next year. But yeah, I mean, I want to do that. I want to do everything. You know, I, I don't want to limit myself. I just like it all. I just want, and I, mm-hmm. but most of all, like I keep saying, I want to just have fun. I want to always have fun and enjoy what I'm doing. It doesn't make sense not to. Life goes so quick. You know, we've seen a lot of people pass away. And I'm sure even the older people, you know, you see like, oh, died at 95. I'm sure on their deathbed, they thought I didn't get enough. 95 years wasn't enough time. You know, and it's like, I, I didn't get to finish this. I didn't get to finish that. And, and I'm sure I'm going to feel that way. I'm like, I need another 200 years. What the <laughs> hell? I laughed enough. Didn't that work? I'm sure. But, you know, it's never enough. But in the time that we have, we need to be kind to each other. We need to be considerate and respectful. And we need to do what makes us happy. And that's important. You must do what makes you happy. You know, it, just have fun. Have a great time. This is supposed to be fun. We're here for a reason. It's not to be miserable. It's to be, you know, enjoy it and make other people's lives better. You know, that's also what I like to do. I, I work on movies and it's entertainment. It's whatever, you know, but it makes people happy, mm-hmm. you know, and that's great. And movies make me happy. Like, I love seeing films. I grew up on them. I've, you know, I've been watching movies since I was a little teeny kid. And and I try to watch at least two or three movies, you know, a, a week when I'm working, when we're not stuck. Now I'm watching 400 movies a week but <laughs> <laughs> and finished up, uh, you know, three seasons of Hannibal in two nights. So, <laughs> so I wasn't sure if I should kill people and eat them or eat them and kill them. I was un- unclear about that. But, no, it's real simple, man. Just be cool and have a good time and... 
enjoy life because this is all we got. We don't go around once, I think. You know, nobody's proven it otherwise. <laughs> so <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Well, thank you so much for being here. You've shared so many wonderful stories and it's been amazing to just cool. chat. So well, I really thanks. appreciate it. Thank you, Howard. No, it's great. I love talking. Ask my wife. So <laughs> no, I love it. And I love educating and I like talking about what I do because I love it. And, and, you know, trying to spread the good word of being positive to people and, you know, just be, it's a great message. It's underplayed. It is right underplayed now. nowadays. Like, you know, you don't need to talk smack about anybody. Just, just be happy and just enjoy and be nice to everybody. It's things will be a lot better if you're just nice to people. It's that simple. So I wanted to ask if you'd be willing to do two more stories. Okay. One was, I was curious what your favorite film is mm -hmm. and what you love about that film or what stands out to you. Is that favorite film that I worked on or favorite film overall? I think just, you know, from my perspective, it's you clearly went into filmmaking because you love it. Right. So what is the moment where you're watching a film? And yeah, likely one probably that you didn't work, yeah. to, <laughs> that you didn't yeah, well, work yeah. on. Yeah. That yeah, just really easy. stands out to you. And, and what's so special about it? Well, there's two movies that changed my life. And the first one was Jaws. When I saw Jaws, I, I couldn't believe what I was watching. It was the most terrifying, brilliant film I'd ever seen. I, it's still my favorite film. I can watch Jaws anytime. It's so well made. It just tells the story. Spielberg did such a great job. He treated it like almost like he shot it very much like a TV movie, which was his background. You know, there's no mm -hmm. like inserts and like crazy shots and crane shots and drone shots and any of that nonsense. It just sets it up and it tells you a magnificent story. I love Jaws. I still love Jaws. I don't go in the ocean because of Jaws. So it's been 46 <laughs> years I haven't been in the ocean. And then the movie that really did it for me was the original Star Wars. Star Wars came out and I'd heard all about it, but I couldn't picture what people were saying like oh in the beginning the spaceship shoots over your head and then prior to that we've always just been on that flat level you know it's like oh spaceship mm -hmm. goes across like this and i went to see it at the chinese theater my dad took us we sat out in the rain waiting to go in hours and hours and finally got in and it was it changed my life it truly did i walked out of that movie thinking i'm going to work on films like this this is the type of movie i want to work on mm -hmm. and i've never worked on a star wars film and I, I think at that point, I wish I did. Now I'm okay because it's not where I think it would be, you know, in my mind. And I prefer just to keep the, my dream the way I think it mm -hmm. is. But Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back, you know, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg could do no wrong in my eyes. And I just, those movies were magical to me. And the, yeah, changed my life. I was like, I'm going to, these are the movies I want to make when I grow up. And they were. It's amazing. And uh, so I have to ask one more story, which was from, yeah, I've heard you tell it, mm -hmm. and I would love if you share it again. And sure. that's just what it was like for you to be a part of Kill Bill. Oh. And what it meant to just step up into that challenge and what the process was like. Well, on Kill Bill, Greg was supposed to go do Kill Bill, but his wife got pregnant and he couldn't go. She was delivering. Actually, as I got on the plane, I was on the phone with Greg. He was in the delivery room and he's like, the baby's coming. And I'm like, I'm <laughs> getting on the plane. It's like, there's the head. I'm like, I have to shut the phone off. <laughs> <laughs> and so Devin, who's Greg's son, was born when, as I was leaving and got onto the plane. Wow. So Greg obviously couldn't leave his wife for what was originally supposed to be three weeks of shooting in China. Turned out to be six, seven months, which my then wife you know, wasn't very pleased about, hence why she became my then wife and, or has become my then wife. It was amazing, but I didn't know what we were in for. We just went with a bunch of stuff and hoped that we could make stuff happen. I had two other guys with me, Christopher Nelson and Jake McKinnon, and 500 gallons of blood and a ton of body parts. And But we didn't know. We didn't know because basically, like you know, we talk about quitting scripts. That scene was kind of like, and then all hell ensues. And I'm like, what does that mean? You know? <laughs> Same with Dust Till Dawn. It's like, and then all hell ensues. And I'm like, that's a six week shoot of all hell. And so we went to China, tried to get stuff going there. It was very difficult. It was super, super hot, humid, miserable, sweating like a pig. Quentin is very demanding as he should be. And at first the effects aren't going just as well as we had hoped. And we're trying to rethink things. And the thing is we're thinking to inside the box and Quentin says, you guys got to get out of the box, get out of the box, start thinking beyond. Uh, and we started thinking about it and we started watching what some of the Chinese guys were doing and the stunt guys. And there was like Quentin wanted, like when people were getting slashed, the blood to shoot out. 
And I'm like, oh, well, normally that would be a squib. And he's like, we're not doing squibs. I'm like, okay. Well, that would be a hose. With he's like, we're not doing that. And so I was looking and I saw that the Chinese stunt guys, they took condoms and they would fill it with blood, wrap them up, and they'd hold them in their hand. They were small. And on impact, they'd shoot them and blood would spray out. And I'm like, oh, that is genius. So I talked to them best I could. And I went out and I bought condoms, but I had bought like American condoms. They're like, no, 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 no. They have to be Chinese condoms because they just break. And I'm like, of course, there's, you know, there you go. That explains it. So I went and got this and we filled it with blood and we had a big bucket of water and we put all the blood condoms in there because that way they wouldn't stick. They would just float and they wouldn't break. And we would hand them off. And Quentin's like, now you're thinking outside the box. You talked about squibs. We can't do that. You figured it out. So Quentin pushes you to figure out, yeah, there's 10 ways to do this, but what's the way you wouldn't do it? And that's the way I want to do it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we had this great experience and we stayed there for seven months and we did, I kid you not, at least 40 to 50 blood gags a day, just Chris, Jake and myself, you know, the beginning, the day would start off with a rehearsal for the first half of the day. And I take notes and what, you know, like, and this guy's arm gets cut off. This guy gets split in half. And I go over to Chris and Jake. I'm like, okay, so what do we have for this? He's like, no, we got to make it. And I go to Quentin and I go like, when do you think about shooting this split thing? Oh, we, we got plenty of time. We're not shooting that till after lunch. And I'm like, <laughs> Lunch is in six hours. So we'd be putting stuff together and we did electromagnets and came up with a whole bunch of cool things. I think at first, Quentin, like I said, wasn't like he was like, this isn't happening. It's not happening. Maybe this isn't going to work out so well. But then it kicked in. Mm-hmm. And I was really glad that he had the patience to stick with it and let me try to figure out where our shortcomings were. Mm-hmm. I felt we were very handicapped the whole time. But once we got the momentum and the crew clicked, and that wasn't just with the U.S. crew. We clicked with the Japanese crew, the Chinese crew, and because we'd all go out. And I always said, you know what? None of us understand what we're saying because we speak different languages, but we all laugh in the same language. Mm. And we would just go out and laugh and laugh. And I understood the Chinese guys laughing. I understood the Japanese guys laughing. I was like, there you go. Laughter is universal. That's the international language, you know, is laughter. And we had the best time. We never knew what we were talking about, but we would eat and drink and play games and and laugh and it was great so you know we finished up in china finally got home we had like another six months shooting here in la which was all the desert stuff and all that and you know we shot the movie as one movie and then it was so long quentin decided to cut it in half which i think was a great idea and make two films out of it and uh, there are two films i'm super super proud of and i worked so hard it was so exhausting and really kicked my rear end but it was unbelievably rewarding i'm again on my top five of like most proud favorite movies i've ever worked on it's amazing thank you so much howard you've been so generous with your time thank you so much Until next time, thank you so much for tuning in. For show notes, including links to anything and everything mentioned in this episode, please go to outliers.fm. If you enjoyed this episode, sign up for my weekly newsletter. You'll be the first to hear about new episodes before they're released, and you'll get the best quotes, themes, and ideas from each episode in a weekly update I call Inside the Episode. To sign up for that, just go to outliers.fm slash newsletter. Just two more things before you take off. Number one, if you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review in iTunes. My amazing team and I invest countless hours planning, researching, and editing each episode because we want all of them to be amazing. And we hope you enjoyed listening. If you did, please consider taking 30 seconds to leave a short review in Apple Podcasts or iTunes. Reviews are crucial in helping us get the best guests and helping more people find outliers. So if you have 30 seconds, please take a moment and leave a short review. Thank you so much. Number two, if you haven't already, sign up for my Friday Five newsletter. Each Friday, you'll get a short email where I share the coolest things that I've been using, loving, and pondering each week. Those include new products I'm trying, supplements I'm experimenting with, people I've been studying, books and articles I've been enjoying, and so much more. It's super short, it's filled with awesome and interesting stuff, and it's a great way to get inspired each week as you head into the weekend. To get access, go to friday5.email. That's F-R-I-D-A-Y-F-I-V-E dot email. Thank you so much.